Okay, hello students. Um, this is just an overview for chapter 36, which comes from your Modern Dental Assisting Textbook, edition 13. Um, chapter 36 can be found on page 498. So you can feel free to look onto that as I reference it as we go on in this lecture for chapter 36. Some of the learning outcomes, uh, the main ones, along with the learning outcomes that are listed on page 498, we will be reviewing key terms and discussing different types of moisture control and their indications. And we'll just briefly go over oral evacuation and how it's used with the suction tip and high volume evacuation tip. One of the most important functions we know is moisture control, especially when we're doing fillings like composites because we know that any type of water that goes into the procedure can actually contaminate the entire procedure. In addition to that, sometimes there's saliva, there's blood, there's pieces of te teeth that are kind of floating around in the mouth as we're drilling or as we're taking out a tooth and also things like excess dental materials like cements and excess filling. So it's important to have, <clears throat> it's important to have that the suction readily available or nearby in the mouth so that the patient doesn't swallow it or it doesn't go all over the place. There's two types of oral evacuation systems. There's the saliva ejector and the HVE or high volume evacuator. Okay, the saliva ejector is more straw-like, it's bendable, it, you can manipulate it in regards to its shape. Um, it's indicated for uh, preventative procedures like a general prophy, fluoride, placing sealants. Um, it helps to control the saliva, especially in the back of the mouth. Um, and even for cementation, uh, for bridges or crowns, or even for general orthodontic bonding procedures. And as you see here in the picture, you can see how we were able to bend it and they were able to place it right from the tongue. So it is manipulative. And here you have the, uh, you know, the actual saliva ejector as you see fit when it's straight or when you bend it, okay? This can be used for quick sweeps or it could be stationary in most cases, it is stationary and it's placed on the back of the mouth while the operator and the assistant are performing some type of procedure and you're holding the HVE at the same time. So this is speaking of the HVE, this is the HVE. It could be metal, it could be plastic. Either way, there should be a ventilated tip right here and usually these guys are angulated. I rarely see um, a metal one, but they do exist um, and uh, for obvious benefits. You can autoclave this, um, whereas a plastic one, you just simply throw away. It's a one-time use, okay? It definitely reduces the, the aerosol that's caused from the high-speed handpiece. It can uh, retract the tongue because, it, because of the stiffness of it, and it keeps the mouth free of saliva, blood, water, and debris, okay? Um, it also can be in a thin, uh, a thinner version, and the thinner version, a very thin version, actually, um, with a smaller circumference at the tip. And this is usually uh, for um, like surgery. So this is considered the surgical suction tip. I have uh, I have seen both. Uh, usually the metal one is in an oral surgery office or in a operating room in a hospital, uh, whereas the plastic one is usually in general um, general practitioners. Don't forget how to hold it. Uh, usually when it comes to the HVE, it's held in a thumb to nose grasp or the pen grasp. So the pen grasp is right here, just like a pen. And then the thumb to nose grasp is usually held with the thumb pointing towards your nose when you're holding it, okay? And usually this is the most popular way to hold it is the thumb to nose grasp because of the weight of the piping. And again, again, don't forget to uh, review the positioning of the HVE when it comes to where to place it in the mouth. Okay. Um, you can like of, uh, like we went over this in DNA one thirteen, uh, chair side assisting one. It depends where the operator is um, working on. If the operator is working on the front, then uh, then you place the HVE in the back. So depending on where the operator is working is where you're going to place the HVE, okay? No matter what, for a right-handed dentist, you want to place the suction in your right hand and air water syringe if you need that in the other and vice versa. Again, timing is critical.
because you know when you're in the middle of a procedure things are going pretty quickly uh you always want to keep that beveled edge parallel okay where the occlusal surface is or a little bit beyond it okay okay and this is just like a cartoon version of uh where to place the hve depending on where the operator is um the, uh, the, the, this can also be found in your textbook, okay? And then there's daily maintenance of the evacuation system. Uh, you always want to maintain the uh, the entire unit because anything can get suctioned up into the unit. And it also, you know, this also follows the infection control policies. You want to check the traps. The traps could be found at the under, usually underneath the patient's seat. Uh, you want to make sure that if there's anything, you know, clogging the the system, the suction system, that everything is removed. And also, we want to make sure at the end of the day that we rinse with an antimicrobial solution. Rinsing the oral cavity could be done by two two ways: limited area rinsing or full mouth rinsing. Limited area rinsing, you're just rinsing really quickly when there's a brief moment in the procedure. You just want to quickly sweep with the air water syringe and quickly just suction it out really fast from the patient's mouth. And then of course there's the full mouth rinsing where when there's a longer amount of time where there's a pause or at the end of a procedure, what you want to do is just rinse out the whole mouth with the air water syringe tip and then use the suction tip to evacuate everything that's out. Okay. And then of course the saliva ejector can be used as an alternative to HVE with some limits, of course. This is your air water syringe. It could be metal. The tip could be metal or it could be plastic. Okay. Uh, you obviously have seen both in, in DNA 113. And uh, these, these parts can be actually screwed off. So usually they come in three parts, uh, the actual equipment. So the isolation of teeth can be done in three ways. You can use cotton rolls, you can use dry angles, or the dental dam, the dental dam. With cotton roll isolation, the problem with that is that the thing moves around, right? The cotton roll moves around in the mouth and it's not as stable, okay? It's not as stable, but it's easy to use. You just slip it into the side of the cheek and there you have it, but it has its limitations. You can't do it on the lingual surface, for example, of the maxillary of, of the palate, for example. Um, so there's, and there's only so much it can, it can actually push aside or so much it can actually retract. It also tends to stick to the skin or the gums of the mouth, and you do run the risk of a patient swallowing it. So you have to be very careful. And it tends to get wet. Here's an example of it. You can isolate completely like this on the mandibular, but it does get soaked after some time, and then you have to remove it. So, you know, it's pluses and minuses of it. Uh, you do have cotton roll holders that you can use to stabilize that in place. You also have dry angle isolation that looks like this, these triangles, which are really helpful especially when it comes to the maxillary, but the triangle isolation can only be done on the buccal mucosa. You can't put this anywhere else. The dental dam is very comprehensive. Um, it it de definitely acts as a great barrier. Uh, it definitely you know safeguards the patient's mouth, prevents them from swallowing anything, which is great. Um, it protects contamination of the tooth, for example, when you're doing a root canal, because you don't want any saliva going into the nerve while you're doing a root canal for example, in the field of endodontics. And then of course, you know, it acts as a great moisture control device and it actually allows you to actually see the tooth better or the quadrant better than it would be without using the dental dam. This is how they look. They come in different sizes. Some of them have great scents um, and flavors as well. There's the frame. You have the U-shaped frame, the young frame, and the Otspie frame. And of course, the dental dam napkin that goes on underneath the dental dams because you know the patient sweats or there's some moisture that develops on the lips. So the napkin helps to absorb that a little bit. And then of course you have the dental dam punch um, that's used and you can manipulate the little table um, on the bottom. Uh, there, it comes in different sizes, each punch hole uh, to accommodate the different sizes of the teeth you're working on. Okay. And then of course you have your clamp, which is shown here. This is placed on top of the dam on the tooth, and it has to have a ligature attached uh, to it to prevent the patient from swallowing. And here's your stamp that we use as a template. You don't have to use this. You just stamp the rubber dam, and then you can hold, uh, punch holes using the, the, the dental dam hole puncher 
um, to punch a hole in the select teeth that you will be working on in that quadrant. Here's the dental dam forceps that use that is used to uh, manipulate or hold the dental dam clamp. And notice it has a locking bracket in the middle and it locks it in place. Um, and as you as you press your fingers or rather the two handles together, it expands the clamp so that it can go on the tooth. Here's the clamps. Um, there are parts of the clamp and different sizes of the clamp. Uh, these go only go on posterior teeth. These do not, none of these clamps go on the ones that you see here. They do not go on anterior teeth, but the parts of the clamp that we deal with are called the bow and the jaws. Okay, and here's the bow right here, and here's the jaw right here, okay? Okay, and some of them are winged, and the ones we worked with in DNA 113 have wings on them, and this helps to keep the dam kind of under it, and, and you know, the dam kind of stays in place like that while it's in position on top of the tooth or encircling the tooth. Here are at the top are the two anterior clamps that you use on anterior teeth, and then, as you can see, the orifice that the clamp um, looks like uh, is dictated by the size of the tooth. So you have molar clamps and you have premolar clamps. All right, and this is how it looks when you fit the forcep onto the clamp. Okay. And remember, this must never be omitted when you have ligatures on the clamp. It must be tied onto it such that just in case, heaven forbid, the clamp kind of goes down the throat or close to the down or close to the um, the back of the throat. You have a way of retrieving it or at least gliding it out forward to prevent anyone from swallowing it. Um, again, when it comes to um, you know pre preparing for the dental dam, you want to consider certain things. Uh, you you know like maybe you'll have missing teeth. Uh, you don't want to punch a hole in an area where there's no tooth because the whole purpose of a dam is so that saliva or liquid doesn't come out from the mouth. So if you punch an unnecessary hole in the area, now you have a perforation and now saliva and liquid are coming out of the mouth and kind of contaminating the area and defeats the purpose of the dam. You also want to consider the sizing of the hole. If it's too large, if the hole is too large and it's on the tooth, it's going to create um, a, a, like a like a like an opening where the saliva is coming out of the mouth through the tooth because the hole is just too large. Okay, so you want to consider certain things. Um, when you want to remove, exactly how you place it is exa exactly how you remove it, okay? You don't want to just jump and take the dam out. You have to first, you know, remove the dam, uh, remove the clamp, and then, you know, don't forget cutting the dam uh, actually as you remove it. <laughs> okay, so the steps in removal, you want to remove any ligature that are stabilizing the dam. You want to use a crown and bridge scissors to cut each hole, creating a slit. Position the forceps in the clamp. Remove the dam and the and the dam. Remove the dam and the frame as a unit. Technically, you should be removing it as one unit. Look at the patient and then hold the dam up and look at that. Make sure there's no pieces that have been torn off and look in the patient's mouth because the last thing you want is a piece of dam stuck between teeth. And then, of course, you floss the teeth. Okay, uh, this is for an anterior tooth. As you can see, they use wax. I've never really seen anyone use wax or compound wax to stabilize the dam, but this is how it would be. You would actually clamp the tooth you are working on. Whereas with the posterior clamps, you don't do that. You work on, you clamp the tooth that you are, you clamp the posterior tooth uh, that you are working on. So for example, if you're working on, on a po with a posterior clamp, if you're working on tooth number 29, you're going to clamp the tooth number 30 instead, okay? Whereas with the anterior one, you clamp the tooth you're working on, okay? So for additional information, I do want you to make sure that you review the purple pages uh, with uh, page 36. I mean, I'm sorry, procedure number 36-1 all the way to 36-4. Uh, I don't I mean, Some of them are purple, some of them are blue. They're very helpful. It gives a great uh, summation of all the stuff that deals with rubber dam and everything that you've learned. Thank you.